Hello to all of our guests uh, in our audience here in Washington headquarters and around the world. Good morning in Washington, good afternoon uh, in Europe. Uh, I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to this latest installment in the Atlantic Council Global Energy uh, Center's uh, CEO series. And I'm joined today by Christian Bruch, uh, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Siemens Energy. Uh, Christian is one of the most important voices on energy, not just in Germany and Europe, but uh, around the world. We're excited uh, to have this conversation with him about how to balance energy security and the energy transition, uh, which uh, many people uh, didn't talk that much about energy security before February 24th and uh, the beginning of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And now this issue is not only timely, but urgent. Uh, we'll also talk about opportunities and challenges presented by the trend toward digitalization in the energy secretary. And then after we finish, uh, you'll hear from a number of panelists who will further explore the links and the tensions between uh, digitalization and security. There have been a lot of cyber attacks and threats uh, uh, lately as well, and we'll have a rich conversation about that. Uh, the discussion will be uh, engaging, robust, and timely. And with that, uh, let me turn over to Christian for some opening remarks, and then I'll engage in, in, in some uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much, Fred, and also from my side, a very warm welcome to the people here in the room, but also online. It's a pleasure really to be here and have the discussion, as Fred said, in an in a urgent matter, right, and uh, not only in a timely matter. Um, let me do some introductory remarks from a perspective of a company which is active as an energy technology company in the world, which is active across the globe in 100 countries of the world and building, is building continuously energy infrastructure. I might state in some areas simply the obvious, um, but I think it's uh, important always sometimes also to reflect on the obvious if you talk about energy transition. You can find all different scenarios and plannings in terms of what the energy world is going to be, uh, from stated policy to net zero, and this might have also an influence on how the energy world is going to look like. So complexity is high in terms of the different scenarios, but I think it's worthwhile to focus on the things which are definitely common between all the different scenarios what we're looking at. And there's a couple of elements I would like to highlight. First of all, the world is going to be more electrical. The electricity growth in the world is going to be significant. I mean, globally, we judge between 2 to 4 percent every year, depending on the region. Probably the developed regions like Europe and the US a little bit less, Asia probably a little bit higher. The second point is the build out of renewables capacity is going to be even faster than this. So the speed in terms of increasing the renew renewables build out in any scenario, whatever we talk about, will be extremely high. With that, we have to be aware that the underlying backbone behind all the renewables, the electrical grid, will see unprecedented investments. And that is something also which so from our perception, sometimes it's underestimated how much money has to go into the grid infrastructure to make the world more electrical and to low, no, allow all the renewables coming in to the system. And as a fourth point, overarching the all different scenarios, I would like to emphasize the point that we need to shrink the problem of energy consumption. We sometimes maybe because it's difficult to grab, underestimate how important efficiency is and how important it is really to electrify also certain processes which are not electrified today. As Fred said uh, in, in the introduction, I think one thing we all learned over the particular past six months, the trilemma remains, the trilemma of energy between affordability, sustainability, and security of supply. With the war in Europe and the obviously aggression in, uh, from Russia and, and Ukraine, we all recognize that all of a sudden in a region like Europe, security of energy supply is a matter. But if you look now over the past couple of months, we also have been confronted with a situation that energy costs are rising in an unprecedented level and even a mid-income family is struggling today in Europe sometimes to pay the energy bill. So the affordability comes very, very prominent also on the agenda. And we have just come out of, uh, uh, coming over from Germany in the midst of a heat wave unprecedented, we have uh, very dry regions, and we see how close climate change is to all of us and that it has an effect on our day-to-day -day life. 
So the trilemma remains, and that is something obviously which needs to be reflected once we talk about energy transition and what we're going to do. You cannot solve it alone. You always have these three things coming together um, to resolve the energy trilemma. Every region has common things, as I said before, but also every region has a different starting point. And let me highlight a couple of these. If I look on the US, I think you are, uh, I would say, energy-wise, have all options. That's a privilege. And we always have to be aware, I mean, uh, the US is blessed with renewable resources as well as conventional resources uh, of the avail availability really to build your system. I think if I, if I look on all the policies, what I see here coming together, that's very consistent with other parts of the world, obviously, where the growth in energy and electricity is covered by renewables. You face out coal and gas going to be a backbone. The, the, the privilege what you have, as I said, is that you have fundamentally a lot of the energy supply yourself. That's very much different from Europe. Europe is obviously heavily depending on energy imports in a lot of areas, not only electricity generation, but also industry. And this is really now in a situation, a rediscussion or reinvention of the European business model with all the industry we have in the countries. How does it work in a world where energy supply probably going to be more expensive to Europe? And how do we actually solve this with the underlying industries in a global um, competition in terms of competitiveness? And then we have Asia, which is the fastest growing energy region in the world with very different countries, with countries who can afford it and countries which cannot afford it. So we have COP obviously upcoming in, in Egypt and one of the key discussions once again will be, like in Paris, how do we make sure that we get a kind of just transition globally and also help the poorer countries in Africa or also in Asia really to make an energy transition and invest all the money which needs to be invested. Nobody going to know really how the energy supply going to look like or the energy infrastructure 10 or 20 years down the road. But I think we have deliberate choices to make as societies once we now to address the problem on how to resolve energy transition. And I just want to highlight a couple of those. First of all, connectivity or not. Do we want to build integrated electrical systems like electrical grids and transmission systems? I think it's a decision to make. Um, which means collaboration between states, collaboration between countries, and really making electricity or el electrons flow. I think this is something which is vastly underestimated, but it's a key decision to, to make. Certain things in energy infrastructure will only be possible with more and stronger grid investments and grid technology, and we also have to be aware that digital will play a key role in that to really use as much as possible, the infrastructure, what we have, as effective as possible. And this is a decision deliberately to make. The second piece is, what are our business models around renewables? Is it a good business to be in? How do we want to design it? I think you had in the US a fantastic track record with the PTCs of driving wind power going forward. What is now the next steps to come? And what are the bounding conditions around it? Europe had a lot of mechanisms which really helped the renewable energy um, to develop. But I think we are now at a stage where we have to revisit what type of policies are required around it. But it's also obviously something which is a deliberate choice to make. Obviously, we look on it from a perspective, particular also of a company which is active in wind power. And we clearly have to say, I mean, as much as we love the growth in wind power, we're also seeing that the industry or the market is only working to a certain extent. Uh, as an OEM uh, in the wind power, we are losing heavily money at the moment because of the constrained supply chains. Uh, I know my competitors do that as well. So the market is not in balance at the moment. And these are choices which we have to make. We need to tackle this and getting a working market in this regard to make sure that it's also a commercial business model behind wind and renewable power. The third element in terms of choice to make is the infamous discussion around hydrogen. What are we using hydrogen for? And what hydrogen is able to do? Is hydrogen the superpower? Or is hydrogen one of the elements in a relatively diverse energy infrastructure? And I would assume, Fred, that we also discuss 
that subject today in our discussion. Um, but it also means if we want to produce green hydrogen, we always have to be aware we need even more electricity. And energy transition means more energy, more electricity, if you want to make these things happen. Um, and obviously, we also have to be aware today there is no commercial business model in, a in the most cases around green hydrogen. So if you want to foster it and if you want to push it, we have to define these commercial business models really to make this transition go along this. And the fourth element in terms of choices to make, I just would want to highlight because I'm, I'm here in the US and I'm coming from a country which has uh, had a deliberate different view on this, is nuclear. I mean, 30% of the global energy or electricity production comes from nuclear. Uh, sorry, comes from uh, comes from the thirty percent of the global nuclear power production comes from the U.S. Um, and that is something which I, looking going forward, believe will play a key role also in the future. Nuclear is an option. Nuclear is an important element, and it's something which we deliberately have to take into account. Even so, I think, let's say, Germany will not change their view on nuclear power. Is at least my expectation. Let me close my opening remarks with a couple of elements in terms of looking on energy also from a geopolitical view. We all learn that energy is always security. It's also geopolitical security. And it's not getting less, it's getting more going forward because whatever we do, for example, with renewables or with a grid infrastructure, we're going to be tied in global supply chain, which we cannot change which we cannot avoid but which we need to manage and we need to understand this on what are the interdependencies we're going into now if we go through the energy transition and how do we manage it also from a security perspective also in a cross-atlantic discussion uh, between countries who are friendly with each other. So this global dependency is something which will not go away as much as we love to talk about localization we have to be aware we will do it in a world which will always be global in terms of supply chain. But I think the effort to manage the supply chain will be higher going forward than it used to be in the past. So what is needed? Tackling the energy transition, unprecedented speed, and we have to discuss on how we achieve that. A business model around change, if you talk about energy transition, because at the end we need to have private capital flowing really into the energy infrastructure. And as an underlying base, we need an acceptance in the different societies of the world to accept this change, what we need to do to make the energy transition happen. And with that, Fred, over to you. Chris, Christian, thank you so much. And while you take your seat, I'll introduce you a little bit more to our uh, in-person virtual audience. Um, uh, holds a degree in mechanical engineering from uh, Leibniz uh, University in Hanover. Studied also in Glasgow got your doctorate in, um, uh, at the Swiss Institute for Technology in Zurich. Uh, you worked as a project engineer in research, uh, uh, appointed uh, uh, president and chief uh, executive officer of Siemens Energy AG, um, and that was in May 2020, and before that 15 years at Linda. Uh, does, they do a lot of work in chemicals, a uh, very important company uh, as well. So you know, this business as a business person, you know this person business as an engineer, uh, and, uh, and I think when you speak of nuclear, as also as a nuclear engineer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let me start uh, with a quote from Dan Jurgen, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, a great friend of the Atlantic Council on our uh, advisory council of our Global Energy Center, and he wrote this month in the Wall Street Journal, quote, the amnesia about energy security is over. Uh, the global energy crisis fueling high, record high inflation is shaking governments as consumers are stunned and angry at high prices and the prospect of shortages. So the, the question that grows out of this, Christian, is how have energy security concerns uh, prompted by uh, Putin's war in Ukraine changed the picture uh, in this balance between energy transition and energy security? It's, uh, uh, certainly uh, an inflection point of some sort. And I, I'm wondering how you're looking at it. No, absolutely. And I would say we're all learning at the moment what energy security means, uh, but it has brought the security element back on the table for discussion. And I think the reflection that energy, energy security is going to have a price. Uh, and we have to 
think about how much money we would want to invest into this or what is the consequence strategically we're having with this. What it now exactly means, I think, is now what we have to develop over the next months and years to come. But I think what it has done, it has really erased, and I would agree with Daniel on that, uh, it has erased the, the, the simplistic view on that you can just focus on one thing and cannot, you cannot walk away out of this trilemma. And uh, so we're seeing obviously... It's an interesting term. Before you go on, trilemma, that's three parts. What are the three parts? Yeah, affordability, security, and sustainability of energy supply, right? And we see it. Every time we pull out one and focus on that one, the other two come around the corner and, and hit us, like the security of supply now. And uh, we have seen it, obviously, now with the war, and people start to reflect and understand the dependencies, what we're having. And this was an interesting learning after the 24th of February, really, uh, what was happening, because honestly, a lot of the, if I look on Germany, a lot of the German industries were just understanding on how the interdependencies between these different elements of having no gas, what is the next sub-supplier who needs this gas, what is the product I'm not getting if the gas is not available, we were all just learning that. And this is why I think we're not yet at the stage that we know on how to resolve the question, mm -hmm. but we do know that any future energy system we design must take into account a view on energy security. And the thing what we have to work around it is what is the price we're willing to pay for it? Because it does mean at the consequence energy will be more expensive than we assumed it to be, and if it is supposed to be secure. That's such an interesting such an interesting uh, answer, uh, particularly there's the short term, and that is uh, going into this winter and going into this incredibly hot summer where it's hard to think about uh, c coming into a cold winter where you could have uh, uh, gas disruptions. Um, everyone has talked about the energy transition being the best long-term way for Europe to get out from under the volatility that characterizes oil and gas markets. But the uh, transition that we're going to have to trudge through is going to have near-term issues of supply issues and price hikes. So I'm just wondering, how do you see the navigation in this short term, uh, which is staring us in the face? Uh, and what does this do to your longer-term goals? Uh, does it slow down uh, or speed up uh, the energy transition? Yeah, no, I think in the short term, obviously, I mean, w one thing we, we do see now, uh, particularly in Germany and Europe, it, that's a little bit unpredictable, right? Because a lot of things going to be dependent on the question whether there's gas coming or not gas coming. And we have to be aware the measures what the country has to take or the companies have to take will be dependent a little bit on that. I mean, as you know, we're, let's say, ramping up coal again for the short term, right? And I think this is the right thing to do to uh, ensure security of supply. But at the same time, uh, if really there would be no gas, it could be very drastic consequences because industries are dependent really on this flow of gas at the moment coming out of the east. And there's no way to replace it fast in the short term. So we talk about 24 until we're really there on a the planning horizon. So that is something where we'll have to see uh, on how we work through this. We all, as a company and as, as individuals, are trying to figure out ways to save energy, we're switching fuels, we're reducing own energy consumption, and this is obviously something which drives the day-to-day -day behavior. For us as a company, in terms of the midterm view on how did it change it, um, we're trying really to get this flexibility of acting into our organization. How can we faster adapt to the different scenarios what's going to come? I do not believe that the current situation is going to slow down the energy transition, all the contrary. Um, However, I think it is uh, really, a con how shall I say, a concerted action between governments and companies really now to frame it. But all what we're seeing is an unprecedented need for, sort of, first of all, infrastructure in the electrical grid. Second, obviously, renewables is, is booming anyway since a, since a long time. The only problem on the renewables for us is getting a commercial model behind it, which makes a, it a profitable approach for us. And we also see still a lot of backbone activities in terms of uh, peaking gas power and stabilizing the grid type of things. So what I'm seeing is rather at the moment still a high demand for energy technologies and a high need for clarification. 
The thing what we need to figure out is really what price ticket we want to put to, to these different elements to define then the energy transition. I'm also seeing the first signs, let me put it this way, the first signs of faster approval procedures, which was always the limiting factor behind changes in Germany. I mean, if I look on the LNG import terminals, the floating ones, unprecedented speed to allow these, to approve these, um, and now the next thing have to come, how can we get faster with wind turbines, grid infrastructure, so forth, in terms of the approval procedures. But I believe it does accelerate the energy transition. Thank you, Christian. So uh, we have a member of our International Advisory Board who's on the virtual line uh, from, I think she's going to be calling in from Turkey. Let me turn to Abru Özdemir. Maybe she can introduce herself a little bit to you as well. No, we uh, know each other. Okay. But, uh, yeah, we know each other. Chairman of Lima, and, and, and Abru, give, uh, give uh, one sentence about what your company does and then your question, please. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm the, as Fred said, I'm the International Advisory Board member of Atlantic Council, and we support Atlantic Council in Turkey program. And we are a construction infrastructure company, but we have a lot of investments in energy generation, distribution, and trading in Turkey. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, so energy is a very important thing for us. And we just recently built the longest span bridge in the world. So we do a lot of infrastructure as well. Uh, and thank you, Fred. Thank you, Christian. And as you both said, uh, with the recent trends, like high inflation and backdrop of geopolitical issues, um, definitely they create new waves in the global energy demand. Also in our side of the world, uh, there's a lot of stress. And now more than and ever, a coherent and united approach will be needed on global energy security. And as now, I'd like to ask about the business leaders like us of today. I think we have to be very essential to share our knowledge, which we where we work in different sectors across the board, like us, we're active in 14 different uh, countries in three continents, including Africa, where energy is a totally different story there. And we have to find out opportunities and solutions for a better future. So in that perspective, my question will be, how can market leaders like Siemens Energy, you have, you're enormous in energy, could support an equitable energy transition in the developing world? And what actions will be needed considered by other market leaders and decision makers alike? Thank you. That, that's such an interesting question and with an underscoring in the developing world. Yeah, no, and uh, uh, thanks for the question and obviously, um, we, we know that, let's say, money has to flow from somewhere also to the developing world to make the energy transition happening. What, what are we doing, obviously, as a company? We're relatively active because we cut across really generation of electricity, transmission of electricity, and usage of electricity. We're relatively active also to develop together with countries uh, in the developing world master plans in terms of what to do one step after the other to make it also possible for them to, to look for really parties who are, invested, who are willing to invest into certain projects. So we just signed uh, two weeks ago with Yemen, uh, for example, a rebuild of the electricity infrastructure. We have it in Nigeria with a power, presidential power initiative in terms of saying, hey, first comes the grid or here comes the generation. This is what we need to do to connect renewables. This is the backbone. So what we are uh, trying to do is bring our planning power in, our planning capability to help the governments to to get their arms around the complexity of an energy system. Because the problem with energy is it's always super complex, right? And where do you start first? And to break it down in digestible steps and phases, uh, we did it also, for example, for Iraq. Uh, we did it with Egypt, I mean, where we obviously added a lot of uh, infrastructure in there. And then, obviously, we as a company have the ability also to take it then to governments, to our own, let's say, German government, but also to other European governments or uh, parties in terms of engaging to actually define this. And I would agree, um, particularly in the developing world, uh, that is something where the industrial countries uh, really have to make sure that the 100 billion which were committed in, in, uh, in Paris are really flowing at one point in time and that we have projects behind it and then we have re afterwards really plans behind it. Uh, and that is something which uh, you can only do if you have a clear plan on how to execute. This is what we're trying to do. Um, uh, obviously, we're normally not an investor, right? We do here and there some seed investment to make sure that people feel comfortable with that. 
Um, but we are trying then to get other parties also on board to be an investor, including also uh, governmental aid or, let's say, uh, credit uh, support really from the governmental side. Uh, thank you for your question, Ebru. It's interesting when you talk about the support from government side versus what business invests in itself. We had a conversation uh, earlier uh, where you gave the statistic that three to four percent of what's needed for the energy transition will come from subsidies or is coming from subsidies, but the rest is going to come elsewhere. So what role do the subsidies play? And then what role does really uh, uh, innovation within companies uh, themselves play? Well, I think subsidies are super important in terms of bringing an uh, ignition spark really into the system and getting things going and getting an understanding or a focus particularly around technologies which are not yet fully commercial. But we should not be carried away by the belief that you can subsidize your way through the energy transition. I think this is a key message in terms of, at the end, building commercial models around it and helping policymakers to frame the setup in a way that there is a commercial model why private money is flowing into these investments. What um, subsidies can do is to test out certain commercial models. And we have seen it with the PTCs in, in the US. We have seen it with, we see it, for example, currently with certain hydrogen uh, funding schemes in Europe where the uh, subsidies are trying to overcome the problem that the operational cost for hydrogen units is too high. It's not the capital as much, it's more the operational cost. And to bridge it to what Bill Gates always calls the green premium to overcome that. Um, and I think this is what subsidies can do. What subsidies cannot do is rebuild an infrastructure. Yeah. And, uh, but I think in terms of piloting things, demonstrating it and helping the industry then uh, to build the rest around it, subsidies are good in this. Companies like ours need to continuously invest into innovation and uh, really provide also the um, commercialization of the technologies which are needed. A lot of the technologies we talk about in energy is not so much um, about reinventing a technology, it's more in terms of getting it commercially viable, getting the prices down, um, or getting the supply chain re resilient on that. Let's take hydrogen, right? It's a relatively old technology, it's relatively straightforward, but could we design the systems with the um, uh, resilience and operability at a price where we would like to have it? No. So it's more a supply chain element, um, but this is what companies need to do. The thing around energy transition where I would always warn us a little bit, don't wait for the silver bullet on technology. I think we have all technologies available to really drive energy transition, right? And uh, yes, we will need more technology. That's not a question. And, and we're active in technologies also like fusion, where we uh, believe 10, 15, 20 years down the road, this can be important. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't be holed up by driving the energy transition by waiting for something, because there's, there's a lot of elements there in the toolbox which we can use. Let's, let's stick with that for a moment. Uh, so there are technologies that are new, newest technologies, renewables, batteries, uh, etc. And then there's the technologies that could decarbonize carbon, so in the fossil fuels. And a lot of people are arguing, or more people are, more people than previously have been arguing recently that there's disinvest, the disinvestment in the fossil fuel industry through um, financial disincentives, et cetera, has now, is now posing a problem. Uh, do you agree with that? So when you're looking at this mix, um, uh, fossil fuels versus renewables uh, in the transition, uh, what are we learning about all of that? No, I would absolutely agree with the statement because I think there is no flip of, of a switch. You do need this bridge around the fossil fuels. I'm a strong believer that uh, particular gas is an important bridge to get us faster with the CO2 emissions down. That's what fossil fuel can also do. And uh, obviously, I see it also as a problematic element, as you mentioned, Fred, um, that we do not create enough incentives to invest into these gray areas between the black and the white. I mean, there is some very clear, uh, let's say, black side technologies. And there is, a, I mean, you have the renewables and batteries, and this is a good technologies. And then you have the middle part where the energy transition effectively happens. And this is where the money has to flow. And we have to help investors to allocate there the money to bring down CO2, maybe not in the first step to zero, but to a certain extent lower than before. And this is a concern I have particularly in the financial industry, 
that we're looking too much black and white and miss out the big middle um, to, to really also steer the money flow. And this is something what we have to really emphasize in the, in the next uh, month and years to come. Um, how do we foster energy transition really in this gray part, which still has some right. fossil fuels in it, because there's no other way but to go through this valley of, of still having outphasing fossil fuels. Um, just by ignoring it, it does not get resolved. And, and I think you're going to hear more about this in COP27, COP28, Absolutely. than perhaps you did in COP26. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you talked about nuclear in your opening comments, uh, and uh, you know, in, interestingly saying that's going to be playing a role and maybe even a bigger role, but the politics in Germany being what it is, you, you suggested that it wouldn't change much there. Uh, where do you see nuclear playing the biggest role, both in terms of what energy it provides, and then geographically, where do you think it's, uh, it's going to be most important? Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, I, I do think, uh, I mean, just looking on the energy system going forward between renewables and storage, I have a hard time as an energy systems engineer really to see that. And I believe uh, this, this uh, big base power on nuclear in, in regions is something which is required. That is, for me, the uh, as long as I don't see any other technology, still a key element to drive. Um, my comment to, to Germany before was more saying um, we are in Europe, we are an interconnected community in Europe. Um, I think it's not worthwhile to spend too much effort about Germany itself. We have to look on it from a European perspective. What is France going to do? What is Romania going to do? What is Finland going to do? And how we bring electrons afterwards across Europe. Um, so if I would put a focus uh, in the European discussion, I would rather focus in the societies and countries are saying, hey, nuclear is an absolutely interesting option for us, and then rather think about how do I need to strengthen the electricity grid to make sure that power can flow. Um, I do believe Europe will see um, uh, nuclear power going forward in the refurbishment and obviously also in the new build area. And you can debate, is it then SMRs or is it then larger installation? This is, I think, for me, still an open race because obviously um, I still there's also some argumentation for large nuclear. Um, in terms of uh, the specific price afterwards. So I think Europe definitely will have certain countries, UK, France, certain countries in the Eastern Europe who will look into nuclear extension. US, I think, will always have a, let's say, nuclear home, right? And I think rightly so. We have to see on how the SMR discussion is going small forward modular. to the small modular reactor. And do you think that's the trend right now? <sighs> I don't know, I really have yeah. to say, because yeah. honestly, as an engineer, um, it didn't, let's say, I can understand why people like it, because it's smaller, it's more planable, it's hopefully faster, um, but it's still a nuclear plant. Yeah. And if it's a nuclear plant, why do I not pay the effort to build a big one right away if I need the power? And this is for me something where I would not say it's either or, mm -hmm. right? Everything goes small modular. I'm not necessarily seeing that, um, but I definitely believe nuclear is needed. And then the rest is obviously uh, Asia will see nuclear, let's say, additions necessary because uh, obviously the other energy cost also going to be high. Nuclear always going to be an expensive power, right? But my strong belief is power prices are going to increase anyway going forward. Which will create more of a market. Which that. will create more of a market. So you talked about it some of your opening comments and, and talking about the grid in, in Europe, you're touching on this. The tendency these days seems to be toward uh, less globalization of energy operations, actually less globalization of a lot. There's a lot of talk about deglobalization. Um, many countries looking to generate power and source needed materials at home rather than uh, relying on external suppliers. Uh, but the viability of this approach is certainly up for debate, and I'm wondering how, how you look at this. Uh, you know, what's your perspective on the evolution of energy trade ties, uh, particularly when it comes to the unwinding of some of the global ties? Yeah, no, I think that's a super important element. First of all, I mean, localization always has two elements, right? Localization is about creating jobs, and if obviously a country invests a lot of money into infrastructure, I can understand the requirement for creating jobs locally. That's one point. And I mean, we have more than 10,000 people here in the US. We run 26 factories. Um, and we do it because also we want to create jobs here in the US, right? So that's the one piece we're absolutely in. I understand that, right? 
I would agree with you. We sometimes have now the tendency to argue from a way that you could avoid globalization or global supply chain. And this is absolutely insane, right? You cannot. I think the thing we have to tackle is we have to be more consciously that we have these interdependencies and how do we manage it. But if I look on the mineral requirements we have, particular building out the grid or particular building out renewables, that is so massive in terms of mineral consumption. And I mean, per kilowatt, you need 10 times the material in a renewable energy compared to a conventional technology. Mm -hmm. So you will need more materials and more minerals, which will increase the dependency much more compared to a fossil world. And this is not going away, and this is why globalization is going to remain. With everything what we believe in terms of a very difficult world, geopolitics getting more complex every day, but we have to spend a deliberate effort to continue to drive globalization because you cannot get out of it. But I think you can get smarter in managing your position in this network. And I think it's also an opportunity, particularly in the current time, for a renewed cross-Atlantic type of collaboration around minerals, materials, how you manage these interdependencies, because no country can manage it on its own. And, uh, but I think it's an important element to also make very clear localizing everything didn't work in the past and doesn't work in the future. Very, very interesting comment on Cross Atlantic. You're speaking uh, to the Atlantic Council audience. We believe in it very deeply. But when it comes to critical minerals, that's not where they are as far no. as we know so far. What's the answer? And uh, as you said, more materials, renewables are going to take more materials, more minerals. What, what's if, if, if you look at the global landscape of critical minerals, what concerns you in it, and then where do you see solutions? Yeah, the concern for me is, uh, let's say, twofold. Obviously, we see there's a limited amount of countries which actually mine, really, at certain minerals, and whether it's, uh, everybody talks about lithium, but, I mean, you, let's say, wherever you look into, right, whether it's copper, whether it's nickel, whether it's palladium, so it's some very basic uh, minerals. But the even more concerning element is the processing capacity, where obviously the biggest majority sits solely in China today, um, which is not in principle a problem, but it's something where we have to be aware of. And I think the willingness also to put up a new mine somewhere in the US or in Germany and a processing capacity, at least I think most of our societies have not been willing to accept this, right? right? And it means it's an industry which is not the most wanted one. Uh, so I would also believe there's not a short-term fix on that. The one short-term fix is that we have to be very conscious with our minerals use, which means we have to close the loop on recycling. So if you're producing product and if you bring it into the system, and before obviously we sold it to the market, also us as an OEM, once we sell it now, we have to right away think about how do I take it back? I'm not paying twice for the mineral. And this will be also an opportunity because I think we have strong companies in Europe, strong, strong companies in the US who can actually drive that and find these solutions around closing, closing value chains. And this is something which needs to be emphasized going forward because just tapping into a global existing supply chain and continuously take the minerals out of that to build something, not going to work efficiently because it will be limited in terms of sub supply. So that is something which is probably my key answer. Um, we have to strengthen the recycling view um, in our industry as well. Uh, that's fascinating. We'll, we'll do much more work at the Atlantic Council on critical minerals. This is really a, a crucial part um, of uh, this globalization versus deglobalization. I don't see how you unglobalize that. The last question uh, uh, is about digitalization. And uh, uh, we all know it's going to play a massive role in the energy se sector. Uh, large energy companies like Siemens Energy have thousands of suppliers, billions of network connections, all of which represent cyber vulnerabilities. Uh, this month, Lithuania's state-owned energy group was hit by uh, uh, the biggest cyber attack they've had in a decade. Uh, uh, Russian hackers allegedly ca carried out a cyber attack on Ukraine's biggest energy conglomerate, DTEC Group. Um, so this looks like it's the future. The future is digitalization, but the future is also cyber attacks. What can private industry do? What can public sector do? How do you at Siemens think about the uh, cybersecurity picture? Yeah, now first of all, cybersecurity is for us a growing business, and it's obviously, I would say, is also one of the areas I would say vastly underestimated in terms of amount of money which we need to spend on cybersecurity. 
I think one key element which we can do as a company, but also in the discussion with, with the policymakers, is making aware that we're taking long-term decision which will influence our cybersecurity position. If I decide today about a project to build transmission infrastructure with certain suppliers from certain parts of the world, I'm going to have that for the next decades. And I need to plan for it. And I think you cannot avoid the risk, but you can manage the risk. And this is where we obviously need to be uh, very conscious about, because I would absolutely agree these cybersecurity risks are going to be in our systems. And we have to be uh, aware in terms of planning better and more strategically going forward on that uh, in terms of managing uh, cybersecurity as such. One comment to the digital piece, which I would put a little bit aside, why digital is so important in energy infrastructure. We look in unprecedented speed of implementing projects now for the next decades. If I take all these 2030 commitments or whatever we're talking about, whatever, six time winds, 15 times solar, so many more times infrastructure grid, and so, sounds all nice, right? It sounds like big growth. If you look until 2030, um, we're probably not able to build that amount we have physically, right? Because uh, resources are not there on the minerals, resources are not there on the people, implementation might not be there, logistics might not be there. So we're going to need digital to get the utmost out of our existing infrastructure and really getting the inefficiencies out of the system. We will need it if we want to introduce more renewables, have more volatile operation of our energy infrastructure. So digital is also not just an efficiency element as such, but it's also an indispensable enabler to drive energy transition because that's the only way to get enough capacity in the system because physically just trying to build it in the next years will be very, very difficult simply because the increase of the speed of implementation is so high. Christian, this is such a fascinating conversation. I want to thank you, uh, uh, first of all, for coming to Washington and speaking of the Atlantic Council. I want to thank our virtual audience uh, around the world, our in-person audience. Uh, uh, we've got, in many parts of the world, one of the hottest summers we've ever seen. We're looking into a very uncertain winter. Uh, the, the issues we're talking about right now sounded a little bit academic to many a couple of years ago, but both from the climate standpoint and from the security standpoint, there is an urgency to them uh, right now that w should focus our minds. And, uh, and uh, as we like to say, the Atlantic Council never let a crisis go to waste. So let's do some heavy thinking, and thank you for joining us. Thank today. you very much, Fred. Thanks thank to everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us for the second part of our event today. Uh, my name is Andrew Gumbiner. I'll be moderating the discussion. I'm a non-resident uh, fellow at uh, the Atlanta Council here. I'm also uh, the founder of AJG Strategies, a public affairs firm here in DC. Um, the last conversation will, will be a hard act to follow, but we're going to dive into um, some of the specifics discussed earlier this morning. We have an excellent and distinguished panel um, to dive deeper into part of what was touched on earlier. Uh, we will be taking questions um, live uh, on Zoom, so if you're, um, if you're watching it um, distanced. Uh, we also will be taking some questions uh, here from the audience. Um, the focus of our conversation today is unlocking the power of the energy transition through digitalization and security. Uh, to advance the energy transition, we'll need to build an ecosystem based on connected energy assets that leverage digital technologies and ensure that we are also secure from the persistent threat of cyber attacks. Um, that is the focus of today, uh, and we're going to explore the linkage uh, between leveraging digital technologies to accelerate the energy transition and the cybersecurity solutions needed to secure it. With that, I, I want to introduce our panel. Uh, I have Leo Simonovich, uh, Vice President, Global Head of Industrial Cyber from Siemens Energy. I have Nilu Hao, from, an operating uh, partner at Energy Impact Partners. Um, Scott Sanderson, Director of Global Business Development uh, for Energy at Amazon Web Services. And Mark Orsi, CEO of Gro Global Resilience Federation. So with that, I want to um, kind of start big picture here. Um, the energy transition holds great promise to unlock resilient and accessible clean energy future. Um, there are significant signs of progress all around for the, the very, very deep 
um, and vast progress that we've made on, on clean energy technologies. Um, All-time high sales of, uh, of EVs, major, major uh, auto uh, companies uh, pledging to, to um, no longer make internal combustion engines um, in the pretty near future. Um, the cost of renewable power generation coming down pretty precipitously. Yet we hear time and again from UN reports we are not meeting um, climate goals. So I want to explore this linkage um, between uh, the progress we're making on, on um, clean energy technology and their reliance on digitalization um, and what, that, what uh, digitalization it needs to, um, where that needs to go to advance um, um, climate change. So why don't we start with um, Scott. How do we send, make sense of these divergent narratives? Um, what role has digitalization played in advancing the energy transition up until now, and how impactful will that be in the future? Great question. I don't want to pick a nit with you, but I, I'm not sure they are as divergent as, as maybe we think. Um, what it really speaks to is the scale and the nature of the challenge that's ahead of us. Uh, I read just I think it was last week here in this country, in the US, we hit a record for the amount of renewable energy that, that, was, uh, that hit the grid as a, as a proportion of total is in the mid 40%. Great progress. Probably couldn't have imagined that 10 years ago. Yeah. At the same time, we're burning as much oil today as we did pre-pandemic. And that amount of oil is 100 million barrels a day. Um, a lot of data are thrown out, barrels, billions and trillions of dollars, gigajoules that have to be uh, uh, built and deployed. But let me paint a picture for you about what 100 million barrels a day is. Uh, you've all seen those tanker trucks that deliver oil to a gas station or a truck stop. Typical 8,000 uh, gallons, about 180 barrels. To, to, to get to the 100 million barrels a day that we burn today would be a train of those trucks from Juneau, Alaska to Miami, Florida for our European wow. friends, Madrid to Novosibirsk, wow. okay? So it's just a big challenge, yep. is all I'm saying. And it's also a 100-year-old industry that's been built around the infrastructure, the technologies, the customer value propositions. It's just, it's just gonna take a while. So I'm very bullish on the transition that has happened to date, the investments that have, that have occurred, but we do have a big mountain to climb and we shouldn't, we shouldn't be shy about that. That's, that's a very real thing. In terms of digital, and how it is going to uh, facilitate and I hope accelerate this, this transition. There are several degrees of freedom, and Christian mentioned some, some, some of these similar concepts in his, in his talk, around the grid in particular and how we can leverage the grid and leverage those degrees of freedom to make the existing grid more resilient and more responsive and how to uh, build the future grid uh, in, a, in a more resilient and responsive way too. That has to happen. Um, that has to happen with digital technologies. It ha has to happen at the edge. And, and so as, we, can you talk, and open to the panel here, can, we, can you talk, give the audience a little bit of perspective of kind of what role digital technology is playing in um, renewable energy um, um, deployment when we're talking about moving technologies fur further to the edge um, in a more electrified, a, a more distributed um, energy system? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. Digital technologies are a broad category. They include smart meters. They also include smart wells. Um, there's, of course, the compute that comes with the, all the analytics and extraction and transport of energy, but ultimately the dispatch of energy. There's one more important category, and that is cybersecurity, which helps enable the confidence into these digital technologies for the system to work as a whole. Over the next couple of years, we're gonna add something globally to the tune of two billion smart devices to the system. That is a massive number. And each of those devices is expanding the attack surface. The positive side, of course, is enabling the energy transition in giving us more control over the energy system, which is, as Christian said, is a lot more complex. The, um, I think the, the risk is that those devices need to be managed securely. It's both a question of product security, but in this mesh, in a transition, 
in a, as I would say, you know, it's a, it's a system that's changing and, acceler and the cha that change is accelerating. We, it's not enough to secure the box. We have to secure the system as a whole. And that's where novel technologies like cloud, like artificial intelligence, can play a much bigger role to help us drive solutions that are more comprehensive. So we're going to get to, we're going to get to the specific uh, interplay of of advanced technologies in in digitalization in a second. I do want to kind of before we move on to that talk about what what um, the exposure that the current energy system as we move to a more digital future is um, uh, you know how exposed we are to cyber threats. Um, this gets into a lot of uh, national security issues. Um, the current geopolitical situation that we're in, there's this tension that we're feeling um, between the need to advance the energy transition with digital technology, yet the geopolitical um, atmosphere is getting more complex. So, Nilu, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how the energy sector is in the crosshairs um, for increasingly sophisticated cyber threats, um, you know, recent conflicts in Ukraine, the colonial pipeline attack, really are focusing that lens, certainly in the public's eye. Um, can you talk a little bit about, as we move towards more digital technology, how does that increase our exposure, and what, what should we be doing about it? Absolutely, and, and thank you for inviting me to this conversation. As, as Leo said, as, as we increase di digitization, as we add devices, the number of devices increases the attack surface, and it increases the fragility yeah. of our systems. And that underlying fragility is actually both the risk and opportunity that we face, right? Incredible opportunity for innovation, incredible opportunity for economic gains, but also incredible opportunity for adversaries to um, attack that infrastructure. In the current conflict, we've had glimpses of what that might look like, and there's been two very novel um, attacks in the context of war that happened in the Russia-Ukraine conflict that we hadn't seen before. Um, the first was, one of the first attacks that happened was um, an IoT attack against Russian e-car charging stations yep. that not just defaced those stations, but actually the Russians couldn't charge up their cars and drive them. And again, it shows that it's not just about our systems, it's not about the data, but it's about the broader infrastructure. The Viasat attack was also interesting. It's the first time sat satellites have been hacked before. In fact, security researchers have shown that we can hack a decommissioned satellite and use it, um, which is a little bit scary as we think about the number of satellites that are getting launched into space. But also the Viasat attack, which was really aimed at um, uh, Ukrainian communications, um, interrupted uh, the communications for wind farms in Germany. Mm -hmm. So as we think about security, it's not just about the network, it's about the resilience of the entire infrastructure. And that infrastructure is not today resilient or redundant because we haven't thought about it that way. And um, the energy sector is on the front line of geopolitical conflict, uh, whether it's disruptive attacks, um, whether it's intrusions, um, it is, uh, it, we have seen it with the Russians, it is the first place they go. Uh, and so it has to be, we have to think about these systems with security in mind as we build them. And we have to think about the systemic failure that, they'll, that can come as a result of you know, a truly orchestrated attack. So uh, staying on this topic a little bit, and I want to bring Mark in, um, you know, we've learned a lot, like uh, th these, these recent attacks, uh, particularly with the situation in Ukraine, and uh, Colonial Pipeline have brought these issues to the forefront. I mean, it's, it's really, they are, they are on the front pages of, of newspapers in a way that they really have been a little bit more behind um, closed doors or, or industry experts focused on them more. Um, what, what, has, what have we learned in, in the, the, the past year and a half? Um, what needs to be fixed? What needs to be updated, particularly how industry and government are working together? Um, what positive signs, what, what, what worked and what didn't is, is um, my question. Well, yeah, I think uh, information sharing is, is uh, sort of our, our bread and butter. It's what we do. Um, and, and that's the key. We're sort of the, the nexus between government and, uh, uh, and the, the uh, public and private sectors. Um, so we're, we're trying to help uh, take the information that the governments have uh, filter that in some way and make that av available and accessible to industry, but also take uh, information that industry has about threats and vulnerabilities 
and then share that amongst uh, those organizations. So um, I think going back to uh, an, uh, an earlier uh, uh, Ukrainian incident where there were three distribution uh, organizations that were attacked um, about a year in advance of a Russian uh, intrusion, um, where you know one of those organizations was was impacted when they actually advanced, um, and and the reason that uh, the other two they they found vulnerabilities, they patched them, they they made some uh, changes, but there was not information sharing amongst them. So the the third one got hit. Um, they luckily they they had operational resilience. They were able to do. Um, uh, make some changes, do some manual things, which helped them continue uh, through that crisis. Um, and, but they were down, I think 230,000 uh, users were down for six hours or so. Um, but if those organizations had shared information ahead of the attack, yeah. then they would have been much better prepared for it. So uh, I want to shift the, the conversation a little bit to, to um, the energy transition and utilizing how, how things like AI, big data, um, uh, analytics are, are two sides of the same coin, really, when you think about cybersecurity. Um, cutting edge cyber solutions require AI, big data, um, um, analytics to run. How is digital, digitalization, energy companies really using digital technology to improve efficiency, lower costs, build, build resiliency, and how are these complementary from a cybersecurity perspective? Um, Scott, maybe you can start us maybe here. Give you an example or two. So um, we have a customer down in, in Australia with a liquefied natural gas plant, uh, Woodside Energy. Two hundred thousand sensors on that plant, getting millions and millions of data points every single day uh, in real time. Yep. Right. And what are they using that for? They're using, they're deploying the AI and the ML tools to increase their throughput and reduce their costs. When, when an LNG plant is reducing their costs, fundamentally they're reducing their energy consumption, right? So they've seen a, a three, four percent increase in throughput and yield and a two, three percent decrease in, in energy consumption and carbon footprint just by using these, these technologies. Very little capital involved in these sensors. The price of sensors are coming down. And of course it all has to be secured at the edge because it is a real-time critical infrastructure system that they're, that they're using every day. Uh, similar thing with SEPSA. Um, in, 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 in Europe, we're getting 70 million data points a day from them. And all to optimize and harmonize the different units within their operations uh, in real time. And that's how we get improved efficiencies. We, we leverage the, the degrees of freedom that are built into those systems, give them better throughput, better output, and a lower carbon footprint. Yeah, yeah I, I would love to pick up please. this point. So, you know, we, keep, we talk about all the opportunity and the outcomes that we can drive through digital. At the, at, at, the, at the intersection of opportunity and risk, there's the need to understand impact. And that need starts with the view that combines two worlds that typically don't talk to one another. If you want to understand risk, you cannot just look at the digital world. You also have to look at the physical world. Andrew, you mentioned this idea that cybersecurity and digitalization are two sides of the same coin. And that is absolutely right. Because um, as we think about the physical and digital worlds, we also want to understand not just the operational integrity or the efficiency or the new business models, but how the data that we ingest empowers us to understand threats in the physical world. And that is at the core of um, that is at the core of this trade-off balance between digitalization and cybersecurity. Take Colonial. This is what this is an attack that all of us felt on on the East Coast because of the long gas lines. The in that attack, the operator chose to shut down the whole system on a hint on a hint that there was a cyber attack that was impacting their operational networks. We need a greater degree of precision because hints, operating on hints is not good enough. We have to be able to get better visibility into our operations, detect threats faster, and understand their consequences by understanding what's happening in the physical world and in a system as a whole. And that systematic approach is at the core of combining different types of technologies and also different types of ecosystems. 
Yeah, I just want to touch on that a bit. So I think part of this, so as we push energy generation uh, and, and uh, storage to the edge, right, we need that data, we need the digitalization to be able to provide that feedback. We have our, our grids, which are, are slow moving, slow changing, and then as we get to the edge, it's going to be much faster pace. We're going to have this amazing pace of change that meets uh, what we have in technology today. So, so how do we address those needs and how do we segment things so that we don't impact the, the broader network? How do we use the data for efficiency but also for security? Right. Right? How do we think about how we can um, take that information from all the different sources and use that, um, again, to, to enhance our security, to enhance resilience? And if we need to um, you know, protect microgrids separate from the, the main grid, we need to figure out the architecture. You mentioned sort of the, the system, right? Yep. The entire system has to be resilient and secure. And this investment in, in security has to be done because it's part of sustainability as well. Yep. If we have an impact um, you know, in this transition uh, that, that you know, shows that we're more vulnerable because of the transition, then that's going to push us steps back. So we want to make sure that we're secure as we move forward and that we're making the right investments in security as well. Yeah, and if I can just jump in for a second, you know, we like to talk about sort of AIing our way out of this. The yep. truth is we got to get the basics right, and sure. we're not even getting the basics right yep. right now. So, and, and it's not also just the largest utilities, the largest energy companies, but it's the long tail um, of companies that feed the entire energy infrastructure. So the basics of cybersecurity have to be uh, adopted, and with Colonial, you know, you got to know where your IT assets are, and you right. got to manage those assets. Right. If you look at how these attacks are happening, they're not particularly sophisticated attacks. The, tac the tactics haven't changed much over the last few years. They just continue taking advantage of seams in our systems, of blind spots that we might have in our networks and in our organizations. The second part of this is supply chain, and Christian touched on this earlier in his talk. Yeah. We have to understand what we are attaching to our energy infrastructure and the inherent risks of what we're attaching to our infrastructure, and we have to understand how to manage it and create resiliency and redundancy. And the last thing I'm gonna say is there are things only the government can do from yeah. a policy perspective, and, the government ha and governments have to come together to do that with a speed and agility that makes them relevant to today's operating environment. So if you take Viasat again, it took, you know, US, UK, and EU came out to attribute that attack to Russia. It took two and a half months to create that coalition that was willing to attribute. That is way too slow. We don't have the trust built amongst the, um, amongst the, the governments yeah. and the policymakers to move at the speed that our adversaries are moving. Yeah, I, I, think, I think this is a, a really good point. And, uh, what we're essentially talking about is you need to be able to form trusted partnerships across the supply chain with government. You need to know who to call in the event of an attack. You need to be, you know, you look at DHS's um, Shields Up campaign, uh, I think a really impressive um, uh, campaign as we saw, uh, as they saw threats from, from Russia potentially arising on the energy sector and across other areas of, of the economy and gave really concrete and clear steps of what companies can do. It's not just government and, and the private sector, although that is a macro challenge that absolutely has to be fixed, but it's also um, organization to organization. Um, you know, what, to, you know, Leo, um, talk to me about some of the partnerships that can be formed as, as an OEM, Siemens Energy um, is, is everywhere in the, in the energy sector. Um, what are some of the partnerships that can form where um, companies can build trust among one another and then also bringing in um, um, the, the public sector as well? So, so we, Siemens Energy, we're in the middle of the supply chain as an integrated energy company. We have decades of domain expertise. We have a huge install base. And we see ourselves as a responsible steward that can help accelerate the energy transition. We know it's going to take a village. We also know that visibility, understanding your assets, being able to get your, your hands around risk is really key. So to build trust, we have to get cybersecurity right. As Christian said, um, we cannot avoid the risk, but at least we can minimize it. The way to do that is by beginning to monitor and detect faster. That, bring, that means bring 
different data sources from the physical and digital worlds together. It means creating a backbone of analytics to allow us to do detection. And you know, just to give you an example, we at Siemens Energy built an, an ecosystem of different types of partners um, that help us go after some core problems in security, vulnerability management, monitoring and detection. And one partnership that I'm particularly excited about is our partnership with AWS to take our managed detection and response offering, which helps small, medium-sized utilities, um, which oftentimes are understaffed, don't have the capability, don't have the leverage to, to do monitoring themselves, bring it to those customers and doing it at scale, at, at, at better speeds. And you know, Scott, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, but you know, if you bring two companies from, for, with domain expertise, with the emerging technologies, bringing it together to provide those comprehensive solutions, I think we can move the needle in a significant way. Yeah, um, ADFs, we're, we're, we're a cloud company, right? So it might sound self-serving, but it's really an existential for us, security, yeah. right? Uh, we say it's job one, we have to say that, it's, it, but it truly, really truly is. Our scale allows us to invest in security, um, the, the most sophisticated tools for security and people for security, research for security. And we take all of the security that we deploy in, in our base cloud deployments to the same level at our edge cloud deployments as well, which is kind of what Leo was getting to. As we get further and further away from just the, the big data center yep. and we're out at the edge, we have to secure the edge and we have to do it at scale. Otherwise, the transition will happen in some little little pocket, and that's not really a transition at all. Right. So the, the partnership that we have with, with, with Siemens to take security to the edge, applying all of the uh, tools and techniques and investments in security that we both jointly have made, um, will really allow us to scale the data ingestion, the data management, ultimately the AI and ML that will allow us to flex this, uh, this system we have to the advantage of the of the transition. Yeah, I, I, let me just add, I think that's extremely encouraging to see to, um, you know, as we move to the edge, you'll have smaller and smaller players. So we need to support the mid-size of small businesses in their need for security and their need to understand and, and be able to deploy the, the, the tools that will provide that secure and resilient foundation. So staying on that thought, um, you know, I want you to take us kind of in the mind of a, of a CISO at, at an energy company that's kind of just been charged with um, securing, securing uh, both, you know, uh, well, let's just say assets uh, on the grid, which are growing um, to, to force the energy transition to happen. That's where a lot of this is going to take place. So, you know, what impact do these technologies having the visibility and context to understand, oh, is, um, you know, is this charging station just, do, does it need a new sensor um, and it's a, it's a, it's a problem um, that we have to fix or is this a potential cyber threat? You know, what, how, uh, uh, is, how game changing is that view? Um, and then kind of putting it back to where the government comes in, um, what's the process for, you know, you can't report uh, you can't. Not everything is is a you know a macro issue that needs government support. But what is that line where you do get on the phone um, with um, with federal and, and state partners? Yeah, I mean, I think one of, one of the things that comes with this uh, again with this move to the edge is the the potential for widespread uh, impacts that that you hadn't accounted for. So you know, if uh, every uh, microgrid goes down at the same time. You know what? What is, what does that cause to the, the to the grid itself? Um, you need to be considering these new and different uh, uh, threats, the, the new and different um, scenarios which may impact your organization um, that this digitization, that this transition brings, um, and it's like I said, it's rapidly changing at the edge. So you just have to be uh, you know on it all the time to understand what are those new vulnerabilities, what are those new threats, what are the threat actors thinking about. How are they um, trying to take advantage of, of the situation? And if I just, on the question of the government, there's no question that, uh, at least from a US perspective, we have to get our house in order. Yeah. And we have to deconflict what each of the different agencies and organizations, how they, um, how they support the resiliency and security of the infrastructure. So in energy, for example, you have the Department of Energy. You have the information sharing organizations. You have CISA. Um, how do we, you know, where's the front door? 
who's doing what, that piece has to get yeah. deconflicted across critical infrastructure. I agree with you, what CISA has been able to accomplish is tremendous, getting uh, the Shields Up message out, um, focusing, getting the, TT, the, the, the tactics and the specific threats out to the community broadly. Um, but each organization does have an expertise they bring to the table, and we've got to define the swim lanes. Yeah, I think uh, I, I recently had a conversation about Shields Up with, um, with some other folks um, not too long ago, and they said, also commented on, on the impressive nature of it, but um, have we thought about the fact that we're going to have to keep that up forever? I mean, that is a, we're going to have to find a sustainable um, cadence where this can, I mean, th these threats are not going away. Yeah. It shields Up was the right first step. There's no question that Shields Up has to evolve over time to something different that then has sort of graduated sense of where we are from a threat perspective. The issue is the moment we say Shields down, if I put on my adversary hat, you know what I'm going to do. Of course. <laughs> so, of course. you know, we're never going to really be in a Shields down position, yep. but really understanding the specifics around what the threat environment and it, what's happening and how it's evolving um, is very important. Can I just uh, come back to uh, the first part of your question? Yeah, please. Poor CISO, right? <laughs> yeah. None of us uh, wants to put that yeah. <laughs> You know, when I talk to them, they are dealing with a ton of complexity. They have to deliver results for their CEOs. It's a board issue. They now are responsible for operational technology, right? They, um, which is complex. There's a lot of specialization. And uh, it's a tough business, and it's a tough to, job to be in. They have to make sense of it all. And uh, when I talk to them, and we, uh, as an energy company, but also as a security company, um, we've been on this journey for a long time. And we're taking some of these learnings to, to our customers. The, the, first, the first thing I say to them is, uh, first of all, the, you know, the world is not ending. And so we need to, in order to get our hands wrapped around this, we have to deal with fundamentals that Neela was talking about. We have to get visibility. Um, and as importantly, we have to communicate the value of security as a business priority. Yeah. Not just as something that you deal with in the back office, not just as a cost that you put on the risk register, but something that we can measure as an outcome and as a source of a competitive advantage. So if you can articulate that, if you, the CISO, can articulate this as a business problem, business value, and as a way to build trust with customers, then you matter a lot more to the business. Yeah. And the, the integral to that, of course, is being able to drive those outcomes and being part of, part of that. Uh, I want to bring in a great question from the audience here. Um, how will the arrival of smart grids complicate efforts to secure the energy transition? Does this blur the line of what an endpoint even is? There's some existential um, put notes to the end of that. So. Uh, anyone want to take that on? I'll deflect the essential question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I think the, the, the fundamental piece here is um, how do we have to fundamentally think cybersecurity for the grid as uh, greater, as we push further out um, onto the edge where you have prosumers, individuals interacting with the grid in ways that they never have before. I mean, people are going to be plugging electric cars um, into the, the, their homes. Uh, they're gonna have solar panels that could potentially put energy back onto the grid. How do we, how do we what do we have to be thinking about for this future? Well, I, I actually think we need to elevate. It's not just about smart grid, it's about smart cities in general. Mm -hmm. And because that's gonna be a connected ecosystem and each piece of it is gonna create risk for the other pieces of it. Yep. And um, there was a great book that came out uh, about two years ago, Burn In by Peter Singer and August Cole, which basically took um, the future of smart cities using techniques we understand today and showed how an entire city, in this case it was Washington DC, can be brought to a standstill with 10 hacks that are very doable today. And so it's not just about the, the risk that comes from moving to smart grid, it's really the larger risk that comes from moving to smart cities. And the interconnectedness of everything. Yeah. Right, because the domino effect, the secondary effect, the, the um, is you you can imagine it, and you can imagine the bad guys playing playing that out. You know, back from my old days at, at, at in the nuclear power industry, knew exactly if I was the bad guy how I would attack it. Right, mm -hmm. these guys are way smarter than I was 30 years ago. Right, so the, the the cascading effects that are possible 
with this interconnected sure. uh, ecosystem are, are a, another thing we have to be very, very vigilant against. That's, that's really why we have to think about secure by design, secure from the front, and security for the whole system, right? Um, when we go back to Colonial Pipeline and we think about um, operational resilience, so we've, we developed an operational resilience framework over the past year with 100 uh, organizations and some financial services regulators. Um, and really, we talk about business and technology and, and what is uh, them coming together to really understand who are my customers, right? Who are my business partners? What are their needs from my critical services to them? And if there's a failure, right, how can I recover that operations critical service quickly, right, and restore that in a very timely fashion while I'm working on full restoration of all the other services? So the energy companies have been really good about doing this, about sharing resources about responding to, to uh, events uh, and, and you know, switching to manual when they need to, doing things that they need to do to be operationally resilient. We need to continue to think about that as we push to the edge. We need to think about how do we, you know, what is, what is critical? What is critical to the customers, right? And, and how do we uh, quickly restore those services? We need to back up very specific systems to make sure that we're, we can run at 80% capacity or 50% capacity for a period of time yeah. while we restore operations. We need to do that. We need to build that into the system. And then to throw in the policy angle on this, um, we need to develop norms where we have a coalition of folks who don't necessarily share the same values but want the same outcomes, yeah. right? So for example, nuclear command and control, is that off limits? Um, from an attack perspective, and do we agree with a global coalition that those that attacking mm -hmm. nuclear command and control needs to be off limits? Mm -hmm. Th those are places where policy can actually make a difference. Yeah, and that's that's you know we are getting into that that world which there's a lot of white space out there of of figuring out those norms. Um, uh, certainly in the in the in the diplomatic uh, in international international front. Um, Okay, I, I have another question, Leo, you got out of the existential one, but here's a more uh, concrete one for you. Um, how can cybersecurity be monetized or viewed as a profit center? We touched on this a little bit. Um, I do think there's, there's a sense here that um, ultimately there is a price um, somewhere for security. If, you're, if you, your operations are down for five days, um, that is a quantifiable amount of money and therefore one could think and you could start to think through is there a way to monetize um, cybersecurity so um, have you thought through that what are you know what how, how do we approach yeah that? I look I think it's an excellent question and it's a very novel concept because we typically think of cybersecurity as a cost losses shutdowns safety events but what if we flip the equation a little bit and said Cyber, if cybersecurity is a competitive advantage, then and it's, it is an, a great enabler of trust with our customers, especially as we get interconnected with them, then we should be pricing it in and talking about it as a unique selling proposition. Utilities have traditionally not, have not been able to put a price on security. There have been some in certain states in the United States that have recovered those costs in the rate case model. That recovery has been fragmented, disjointed both geographically, but also in terms of what's, what we're able to cover. So I think we need to take an approach, one that doesn't think of cybersecurity as a one-time event that we need to invest in that this is uh, more of a marathon. The second is that we need to create a recovery model that's more sustainable and works over the long term. Third, I think we can't just think of um, cybersecurity as a CapEx issue. And we, you know, coming back to advising the poor CISO, um, not being too obsessed with technology, but being much more obsessed with outcomes and solutions. And if we're gonna do that, then the and then we, the price of security needs to also incorporate OPEX or operating costs and needs to um, encourage partnerships um, between the utility and its suppliers that go much deeper than it, than it is today. We cannot put them at arm's length and manage this through, through supplier relationships. I don't know if others have, have thoughts on this. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, and I, I think, too, um, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, about how uh, the supply 
the chain is important, right? And how uh, we need to make sure that, so in our information sharing communities, we have uh, suppliers, right, and, and vendors that are part of that collaboration. Uh, but I, I don't know how, I, we have to build that in, like you said, into that sort of operational expense, right? Security is not just a one-time uh, implementation. And in this very dynamic edge that we were talking about, you know, things are going to constantly change. So, so how do we make sure that we, you know, continue that security and f systemically, right? Not just for a component at the edge, but how does it impact the entire system? Really, really hard for your... In, for your CISO in, in the prior question yeah. And, yeah. and in this one, like um, there are economic goods you can put a price on, right? Energy, power, clean energy, yep. maybe higher. The absence of an economic bad that's right. is much, much harder that's to right. price, yep. right? And that's, what, that's kind of what you're talking about. So I think it does have to get into the DNA of the company, into the day-to-day, -day, if it has to go into the rate base, if it has to go. From our, from our side, we do have tools on the security mm -hmm. side that, that are optional, that can be bought. AWS Nitro that, that secures the data, gives, gives you, the user, the only encryption key. So even if we were subpoenaed, we can't turn over the data. Yep. We, don't, we, don't, we can't even access it, mm -hmm. right? So there, there are some things like that in, in around the edge where, where some elements of security can be monetized. But in general, from, the, from that CISO standpoint, he or she just wants to sleep at night yep. as much as as much yep. as possible, right? And if I put on my board hat, I, I don't want my risk and security folks thinking of themselves as a profit center. Sure. I do want them thinking about driving business outcomes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and that's I think what Leo was was getting at. And being integral to driving business outcomes, being an enabler yep. of driving business outcomes, that's the mind shift. But trying to think of it as a profit center creates the wrong <laughs> Wrong motivations. Right, right, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, thank you, thank you all for being here and um, contribu contributing to the conversation. I know there will be uh, much more on this. Um, thanks to the Atlanta Council for hosting this event, and um, hope everyone has 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 a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs>